The frightening power of brainwashing media, four tons of salt sold out in just one hour, Little Pinks bombard public phone lines in Japan. Hebei hits another round of flooding followed by hailstorms, exacerbating the situation in disaster-stricken areas. China's Southern Airlines flight attendant falls from aircraft, now in ICU with confusion and multiple fractures. Xi Jinping messed up the economy, which could revive malware catastrophes in China. It's all covered in today's China Truths. The frightening power of brainwashing media, four tons of salt sold out in just one hour, Little Pinks bombard public phone lines in Japan. The Japanese Fukushima nuclear wastewater discharge story has been pushed too far by the Chinese Communist Party's brainwashing media. This has now disrupted the salt market and is having a significant adverse effect on the fishing industry and food supply, posing a grave threat to the livelihoods of Chinese fishermen. At 1 p.m. on August 24, Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Power Station initiated the release of treated water containing the radioactive isotope tritium into the ocean. It is anticipated that this nuclear power plant will discharge 7,800 tons of treated nuclear water within 17 days, with approximately 31,200 tons to be released in four batches this year. Japan's plan spans 30 years, during which around 1.3 million tons of treated nuclear waste will be discharged. Japan's discharge plan was approved by the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, a United Nations nuclear watchdog last month. IAEA concluded that the radiation impact on both humans and the environment is insignificant. However, the Chinese government sees things differently. While the CCP voiced its objections to Japan's actions and banned the import of Japanese seafood products, they simultaneously launched a campaign through state media and online propaganda to exaggerate the pollution of Japanese seawater, causing panic among some Chinese citizens. Consequently, both online and offline stores in China witnessed a rush for table salt. Data from JD7 Fresh Supermarket indicates that sales of iodine-free salt have surged by 208% from the 22nd to the present day, while sales of iodized salt have increased by 149%. In a video, residents of Weihai, Shandong Province, can be observed lining up in long queues to purchase salt. One woman remarked, four tons of salt were completely sold out within just one hour. After the CCP issued the ban, various regions began inspecting and removing Japanese seafood products from Japanese restaurants and supermarkets. Simultaneously, they pressured the food and beverage industry to launch a boycott Japanese seafood products campaign. The consequences have been severe, affecting not only numerous Japanese restaurants but also sending shockwaves across related industries, including China's fishing sector. Reports indicate that some fishermen have already started selling their fishing boats and contemplating career changes. Chinese fishermen have expressed their concerns, with one stating, We just began the fishing season last week, and now we're hesitant to venture out to sea. A person from Fujian made an earnest online plea, urging everyone not to boycott Japanese eel rice. They pointed out that over 90% of the eels in Japan are raised by people from Fujian. This netizen also expressed their concern, stating, the real damage is yet to come, seafood is vanishing from our tables. Drastic changes are on the horizon. Some mainland netizens posted on Weibo, questioning the significance of the CCP authorities hyping up this incident, stating that it's an act of lifting a stone to hit one's own foot. Japan's exports of seafood to China were only 600 million US dollars, and the Japanese government has pledged full compensation. Now, China's seafood industry is worth trillions. If we stop consuming seafood, the ones who will suffer the most are Chinese fishermen. Will the Chinese government compensate them? Some say, can someone please think about the lives of Chinese fishermen? They're too afraid to go out to sea now. Who can help them? They're suffering too. Public opinion is predicted to continue fermenting, leading to a decline in China's fishing industry. China, being a major player in this sector, will experience the repercussions.
the sudden cut of 4.3 billion yuan, approximately 589.9 million US dollars, worth of seafood exports from Japan to China is affecting the entire 3 trillion yuan industry related to Chinese fisheries, approximately 411.57 billion US dollars. This situation is seen as another classic example of Chinese people harming only Chinese people. Little Pinks Turn Hysterical, Bombarding Public Phone Lines in Japan Another group of individuals who are easily instigated by the propaganda of the CCP are the Little Pinks. Recently, these patriotic netizens have taken to making phone calls to public numbers in Japan as an outlet for their frustrations, causing numerous phone lines to become overwhelmed. According to local media in Fukushima, Japan, on August 25, a man who operates four ramen restaurants in Fukushima Prefecture started receiving harassing phone calls in Chinese from 10 a.m. that day. He couldn't understand the content of the conversations, but he could hear the caller's aggressive tone, shouting loudly and mentioning words like processing water and nuclear. After the caller abruptly hung up, they called the restaurant every minute from the same number, resulting in about 1,000 similar calls to the four restaurants in one day. Not only the telephone users in Fukushima Prefecture were harassed by Chinese phone calls, but starting from August 24, the switchboard of the Tokyo Dago Award Comprehensive Cultural Center also received a series of international calls starting with plus 86, which signifies calls from China. These calls often featured thick Chinese and English, sometimes mixed with Japanese words like bastard and processing water. It made the cultural center hard to contact its customers. Consequently, the cultural center had to switch to playing voice messages, instructing callers to dial another number. On August 25th, the official Weibo account of the Japanese embassy in China posted a message, confirming the existence of these disruptive behaviors and categorizing it as criminal behavior. The Japanese embassy has noted that if the targets of harassment are businesses, it could likely result in economic losses, and if it involves emergency medical facilities, it could be a matter of life and death. Therefore, the Japanese embassy has urged the Chinese authorities to handle this matter seriously and in accordance with the law. In addition to these new tactics of making harassment calls, the Chinese Communist Party continues to employ its old-fashioned anti-Japan methods, such as organizing anti-Japan protests and vandalizing Japanese cars, among other things. Diverting Domestic Crises Regarding this matter, Canadian-Chinese writer Xing Shui has highlighted that the CCP is using the Fukushima incident to stir up nationalist sentiments, aiming to divert attention away from domestic crises. Specifically, the economic decline has reached an irreversible point and the unemployment rate is extremely high, which will inevitably exert significant pressure on the CCP's rule. Meanwhile, the people are very dissatisfied and angry with the ruling regime. Chin Peng, a political and economic analyst based in the United States, offered insight, I believe the vast majority of concerned Chinese netizens have never looked at a map of Japan and are unaware that Fukushima is actually situated on the eastern side of Japan. What does this mean? When Japan discharges nuclear wastewater, it primarily affects the waters on the eastern side of Japan and does not immediately impact China. Strangely, at present, almost all authoritative scientists in China specializing in nuclear energy and environmental protection have not publicly expressed opposition. Only CCP state media and various self-media outlets are intensifying the rhetoric about the severity of Japan's nuclear wastewater discharge while simultaneously making efforts to delete online comments that provide scientific knowledge about Fukushima, suggesting it is not as dangerous as portrayed. Xin Shui added, China lacks press freedom, making it very challenging for Chinese citizens to access accurate information. When the CCP exaggerates something, the Chinese people tend to fall for it, leading to behaviors such as the rush to buy salt. Although the Chinese people are undoubtedly victims because China is a closed environment where people are deceived, the CCP's manipulation will ultimately backfire. Furthermore, some Twitter users have revealed that, according to data published by the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, 
covering the period from 1960 to 1991, the total amount of radioactive substances released into the sea worldwide during that time, with the Soviet Union accounting for 65% of it. Yuan Hongbing, a Chinese exiled legal scholar, remarked, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant accident in the Soviet Union at the time was a nuclear catastrophe. However, the CCP regime, driven by its political identity as a communist one-party authoritarian state, did not raise any protests. And today, concerning Japan's nuclear waste, it is manipulating politics to such an extent. This fundamentally shows that the CCP is a political manipulator that prioritizes politics over ethics. He pointed out that the pollution level from the wastewater discharged by the nuclear power plants established by the CCP in recent years is much higher than the discharge by Japan this time. From this perspective, China's economic development has come at the cost of people's basic living conditions. Hebei hits another round of flooding followed by hailstorms, exacerbating the situation in disaster-stricken areas. In the northern province of Hebei, which recently experienced catastrophic flooding at the end of July and beginning of August, cities like Zhuizhou are still in the process of recovery. Residents are grappling with daily challenges to survive. The disaster doesn't seem to have finished. On August 23rd, Laishui County in Baoding, Hebei, faced flooding once again. Later that night, Xingtai and Hebei experienced a sudden heavy downpour, resulting in severe urban flooding and widespread power outages. One local resident commented, this is even more severe than the last time. Last time, it didn't reach this level. Another person exclaimed, the high water from upstream has come down. According to NTD TV, several residents' homes were flooded. In Fashanku village, Zayagezwang town, Laishui county, a mudslide occurred, and it was mixed with hail. A resident said, there's really no solution now. Whenever it rains, there's a flood. The vegetation above has been destroyed by mudslides, so whenever it rains, there's a flood. Not only in Hebei, but also in eastern China, heavy rains have been affecting the region. Specifically, on the morning of August 27, torrential rains struck several towns in Yuhuan City, Taizhou, Zhujiang. The water levels in some rivers surged, leading to road and street flooding. In videos, many cars are seen floating in the water, and some vehicles have been washed away. Landslides have also occurred in some places, with flash floods heading towards residential houses. On August 25, China's National Emergency Response Level 4 for flood control was activated in 10 provinces and cities, including Shaanxi, Jiangsu, Anhui, Shandang, Hunan, Hubei, Chongqing, Sichuan, Guizhou, and Shaanxi. Furthermore, Typhoon Sula has formed as the ninth typhoon of the season, which may bring wind and rain impacts, making the flood and typhoon prevention situation complex. Turning to the residents affected by the disasters in Beijing, Hebei, and Heilongjiang, they have been staging frequent protests at government offices, demanding compensation. Despite the authorities deploying large numbers of police to suppress these protests aimed at protecting the rights of flood victims, the affected individuals continue to use social media to call for visits to Beijing. There are also ongoing plans for large-scale protests within the affected communities. China's Southern Airlines flight attendant falls from aircraft, now in ICU with confusion and multiple fractures. Last week, a rare aviation incident occurred in mainland China. In detail, on August 26 in the afternoon, Southern Airlines Shenzhen branch reported that, at around 14.40 on August 24, a flight attendant was preparing to hand over lost items from the preceding flight to ground staff when she accidentally fell from the passenger ladder car before takeoff of Southern Airlines Flight CZ 3352, Changzhou to Shenzhen. The injured flight attendant has been sent to the hospital for treatment, and the cause of the incident is under investigation. Consequently, the flight was delayed for more than four hours. The report did not specify the duties of the injured flight attendant or the exact details of the fall. This incident occurred at Changzhou Benyu International Airport. 
Currently, the injured flight attendant was taken to the emergency room of Changzhou Fourth Hospital, where she was in a confused state and had multiple fractures. She was later transferred to the hospital's neurosurgery department and is currently being monitored and treated in the ICU. According to Red Star News, both Changzhou Benyu International Airport and Southern Airlines staff stated that they were unable to accept media interviews. This is not the first time a flight attendant has fallen from an aircraft before takeoff. On November 10, 2017, at Zhengzhou Xinjiang Airport's apron, a Xiamen Airlines flight attendant fell from the rear cabin door to the apron while preparing meals after flight MF-8253 landed, suffering from a compression fracture of the 12th thoracic vertebra. On October 23 of the same year, at Shenzhen Bowen International Airport, another flight attendant fell from the rear cabin door to the ground and was found with a broken arm and some skin abrasions by personnel who arrived at the scene. Xi Jinping messed up the economy, which could revive malware catastrophes in China. China's economy is facing a crisis, and there are growing concerns about a range of political issues. In this context, several troubling signs reminiscent of the Mao Zedong era have reemerged. According to a report by Nikkei Asia on August 24, foreign investors are rapidly withdrawing from China. So far this month, foreign investors have sold approximately $9.8 billion worth of A shares, marking the largest monthly outflow in nearly nine years since the market was opened. The Economist magazine, featuring Xi Jinping on its cover, criticizes the authoritarian Chinese government for consistently making incorrect decisions. These decisions have not only failed to rescue the economy but have also plunged it deeper into crisis. The current issues in China are more severe than those faced during the economic bubble burst of the 1990s. A looming real estate crisis threatens to trigger an economic catastrophe. China's official media outlet, Economic Daily, recently published an article reaffirming the policy that housing is for living, not for speculation will not change. Regarding this matter, Professor Yoni Song, retired from the University of California, Los Angeles, told The Voice of America that this approach resembles the situation in 1959 when Mao Zedong's economic mismanagement led to a disaster. Initially, Mao had indicated a need to correct what he termed left-leaning errors before the Lushan Conference, but he abruptly changed course during the conference, deciding not to correct the left but to target the right. This ultimately resulted in a devastating famine, causing the deaths of tens of millions of people due to starvation. Song used the United States as an example, noting that while the U.S. economy is not as dependent on the real estate market as China, it still must handle real estate market issues with great caution because destabilizing the real estate market would mean harming the U.S. economy. However, Xi Jinping seems to be intentionally undermining China's real estate market, which is a dangerous path leading to economic catastrophe. In addition to the economic crisis and even signs of a severe famine, a disaster reminiscent of the Mao era is re-emerging in China. Recently, nine Chinese government departments, including the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs, jointly issued a document titled Implementation Plan for the I Build My Hometown campaign. It cites Xi Jinping's call to encourage college students and entrepreneurs to return to their hometowns, donate money for poverty alleviation, and voluntarily contribute to the development of their hometowns. Yongni Song, a retired professor from the University of California, Los Angeles, pointed out that in Chinese history, the first time people were sent to rural areas was in 1959 when the Great Leap Forward led to food shortages, and the government, facing financial difficulties, forcibly sent several million, even tens of millions of people to the countryside. This was a response to economic problems, with the government shifting the burden onto the people. The second time was in 1968 during the Cultural Revolution when the economic situation deteriorated and educated youth were sent to the countryside. Now, Xi Jinping is initiating a third up to the mountains, down to the countryside movement. Song believes that the idea of contributing to hometown development is a facade. The real issue is that Xi Jinping has mishandled the economy. 
he is forcing retirees to fend for themselves in rural areas and demanding that they use their lifelong contributions to the nation, including retirement pensions and personal assets, to develop their hometowns. This is essentially a final squeeze on them. Song Yongi stated, if the federal government in the United States were to say, all of you must go to rural areas and donate your retirement pensions, wouldn't that lead to a revolt? After working our whole lives, we're expected to give it all away? Veteran journalist Yen Chuan-go recently raised a question on Facebook, if the collapse of the CCP is a high-probability event, how far must the situation develop for the collapse to occur? In his article, he offered his interpretation, suggesting that the collapse of the regime depends on two variables, the speed of the CCP's declining power and the intensity of the Chinese people's resistance. Both of these variables are influenced by economic conditions. Once the economy worsens, people feel the pressure of survival and grievances about social injustice surface. At the same time, economic decline weakens the CCP's power, making it unable to pacify public anger with money and control officials at various levels effectively. At a certain critical point, history reaches the peak moment of the CCP's collapse. Don't forget to comment in the section below to share your opinions on today's topic with us. Make sure to like and subscribe to see more interesting topics from China Truths, and thank you for tuning in.